record on this computer. Yeah. Let me try. All right. So, hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining. And uh, Dario, do you want to, I guess, do some intros? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Nathan. So, my name is Dario. I'm technical advisor at Classics, and I would like to invite you to, I'm really happy to uh, having you here in this new uh, event for the Kubernetes multi-tenancy. So, um, what we are doing here. So, we are a community around Kubernetes, and also, you know, there is a really nice uh, niche regarding uh, multi-tenancy on Kubernetes. So you can play with namespaces, but not only with that. So what is uh, multi-tenancy on Kubernetes? Essentially, um, it's when you're using a shared infrastructure to offer access to this Kubernetes cluster to multiple teams. And there are plenty of stuff doing that because we need to talk about permissions, we need to talk about security, we need to talk about logging, observability, uh, tracing, and so on and so forth. So what we are doing here is to collect all the people that have something really interesting to talk about, invite them in order to get their own, their, their opinion, their point of view, and the products they are working on. So um, today we got- Good evening, hi. Hey. Hey, welcome. Uh, just a brief overview, uh, and some rules about that. Uh, please turn off your webcam and your microphone uh, while Nathan, uh, Nathan, sorry, Nathan is speaking. So we don't get pollution regarding uh, the guest here. So just a few rules. And with that said, uh, we are a community and please subscribe to our meetup.com uh, community there so we can engage with you we can organize new events and we can get also some feedback from you regarding the uh, os that we can have in our sessions so uh, today we are going to talk about metrics we are going to talk about observability with prometheus and we got a rock star here do you mind if i name you rock star nathan uh, do you prefer? Oh, I don't know. I was I was never the popular kid in high school, so I'll take it. Okay. I'll take okay. it a decade later. Yeah, yeah. More. Okay. So we got Nathan today here with us, and he's a rock star regarding Prometheus. We already have the time to chat about what he's doing at Robusta Dev uh, regarding multi-tenancy, and that's the reason why I decided to invite him here to talk about monitoring uh, and obs well, not monitoring, but observability with Prometheus. So. Nathan already started sharing um, um, your screen. So if you would like to introduce you, it uh, would be really great to all the audience. And I'll mute myself. All right. So everyone, um, thank you so much for having me here. And today we're talking about multi-tenant Kubernetes observability with Prometheus. So a little bit about myself. First of all, when I'm not in front of a computer screen, then you can usually find me out in the garden uh, growing different vegetables and fruits. And Second of all, in my more official hat, then I'm co-founder of Robusta Dev, uh, which I'm not speaking about today. Uh, me. And I also run a Substack newsletter called Why This Kubernetes Thing, where we take Kubernetes concepts and we break them down in five minutes. Now, as part of my work on Robusta, we do see a lot of different customers and our end users um, who are using Prometheus and doing multi-tenant Prometheus. So I'm talking about that, what we've seen with our own customers and what they're doing and what I've learned from other people. And um, I will be looking at the chat as we go along. So I can already tell you, yes, there will be a recording available later on, um, I believe on the Classics uh, YouTube channel. And feel free to write questions in the chat as we go. And I'll do my best to take a look and to answer. Yeah, don't worry, Nathan. If you want, I can take a look to the chat and I will stop you uh, with the important questions, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. OK, so the big question is, how should I gather Prometheus metrics from all of my tenants? And just so that we're all talking about the same thing, then when I say tenants, that could be clusters, that could be namespaces, that could be virtual clusters. It doesn't matter to me what a tenant is. A tenant is a team um, that's using like shared infrastructure, or it's one of your customers that's using shared infrastructure, or it's someone you're renting out space to. It doesn't matter at all from my perspective today um, what a tenant actually is. And um, it, those tenants that will often need some form of isolation, so you don't want those tenants to interfere with one another. Sometimes their data should be isolated for privacy reasons. And I'm going to assume today that we want to monitor all of this with Prometheus. So if you're here to learn about data dog monitoring of multi-tenant environments, then you're in the wrong place. So with that out of the way, I want to 
jump right into the juicy stuff and just give you up front the bottom line. And I'm going to speak about all the different options afterwards. But if you take away one thing from this uh, talk today, then it should be that you should probably be using Thanos. I asked on LinkedIn um, earlier today, how are people scaling Prometheus? Got 174 votes. And the results confirmed what we already knew um, and what I know from anecdotal data as well, which is that most people are using Thanos. And uh, Cortex and Mimir um, come in second place uh, if you put them together, and then Kubernetes Federation. So don't worry, I'll go through all the different options and what they are. Um, but if you remember one thing, it's that probably Thanos is the most popular solution. And the nice thing about LinkedIn polls is I can actually see who voted for it. So I know it's people at real companies who are like doing real DevOps work um, and not just random trolls. But now let's jump into this from the beginning. So in the beginning, there was one. You get started, you're monitoring all your tenants. The simplest thing that many people think of doing is to have one centralized Prometheus, and that goes and that scrapes all your tenants. And what this has going for it is primarily that it's simple, but it has some disadvantages. So the first disadvantage is that there's no real isolation. So there's no security isolation, meaning all the data gets uh, scraped into one common Prometheus. And then one tenant who goes to query that data can see the data from other tenants. So no security isolation. And there's no performance isolation either. What I mean by performance isolation is someone at a company we work with recently told me, you know, one of the development teams, that's their tenant, one of the development teams, they went and they added um, some awful metrics that had like super high dimensionality, uh, high cardinality, and they messed it up and they took down Prometheus for everyone. So there's no performance isolation either. And when we speak about isolation, then it's always going to break down into isolation from a security perspective and into isolation from a performance perspective. And finally, here it doesn't matter what tenants mean in your case. If you're running tenants as multiple namespaces and they're all running in the same cluster, um, it, then this is very convenient. You can scrape the different namespaces. It's easy to do. But if for you, a tenant means a real different separate Kubernetes cluster, and the cluster is isolated from one another, then this becomes really annoying because you can no longer do automatic discovery of the targets to scrape, and there are all sorts of other issues. So as attractive as this solution is, people very often move away from it. And then they move most frequently to the opposite extreme. So the opposite extreme is, okay, let's take Prometheus and let's put one Prometheus inside each tenant. And again, a tenant could be a cluster, could be a namespace, could be a virtual cluster, uh, capsule, Komaji, V cluster, whatever. It doesn't matter for the purpose of this talk today. And when people do this, then they put inside each tenant Prometheus, Alert Manager, Grafana, any other Prometheus related tooling that they're using as well. And now we went to the opposite extreme. So here, too, the number one advantage is simplicity. And we've gained a few other things. So we've gained now security isolation, right? So each one of these tenants has its own Prometheus. So by definition, one tenant can't go and query the Prometheus metrics for another tenant because their metrics are in a separate Prometheus. So we've gained this security isolation and we gained performance isolation. Let's say you go and you do something awful to the Prometheus and you put in all this junk and all this high cardinality data and you totally break it. It doesn't break it for other teams. You've only gone and you've broken your own Prometheus. And this now has to do with the responsibility model and kind of an organizational question, right? Um, it, how does your organization handle this in terms of responsibility? So someone on DevOps team we work with said, you know, it's not my problem. We give everyone a Prometheus, they break it, it's their problem. So here you're pushing the responsibility to each one of those. And even if you maintain the responsibility though, then the fallout if one person breaks one Prometheus is limited. It's limited to their own instance and to their own tenant. And finally, this is possibly more scalable than the previous method. I say possibly because um, it's easier to scale many small things than it is to scale one big thing sometimes. On the other hand, there is an ultimate limit for just how far you can scale up this Prometheus inside each tenant. So eventually there are still scalab scalability issues. And there's one major, major disadvantage to this approach. And that disadvantage is that you can't do unified queries. And by not being able to do unified queries, what I mean is, let's say I want to ask, um, what was the CPU utilization in uh, tenant number one yesterday? That's easy, right? You just go and you query this Prometheus. 
Um, if I want to ask what was of all my Prometheus, um, sorry, of all my tenants, who had the most CPU usage yesterday, I can no longer ask that question. Because to do that, I need to query many different instances of Prometheus. So if I want to do a query that involves everyone, or I want to aggregate data between all of these, then with this solution alone, I can't do it. And of course, we will see Thanos, we will see other solutions that build upon this. But in the simple version of this, I can't do it. I have no unified queries. And there are two other minor disadvantages. For some people, they will be major disadvantages. For some people, there will be benefits. Again, it depends on your environment. Um, and those are one, no unified management. So I'm managing a bunch of separate instances of something. And two, um, potentially there's more waste of resources here. Let's say I have a thousand tenants or 10,000 tenants, and each tenant is getting its own Prometheus. And most people aren't even using that Prometheus. So that adds up to a lot of waste. Whereas if I had one centralized Prometheus, things would be a whole lot more efficient. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on here from the first kind of two simple solutions, right? Like one or many. And then we're going to look at different hybrid solutions and more complicated stuff. But before I do that, I want to just pause for a second and see if there are questions um, on what I've spoken about up until now. Oh, there is a question. Uh, wonder if you cover how to handle A B resource monitoring when you have service A and service B switching in monitoring queues. Um, so I'm. For, uh, I wonder if frac. Maybe I'm pronouncing that wrong. Fact true and eight. Um, it, could you provide um, more details about what you mean by switching and monitoring queues? Yeah, yeah. You can elaborate a bit more, and we can dig it uh, after the uh, presentation. I'd say. Okay. Any other questions about um, the single approach versus the multiple approach? Don't be shy, people. Come on. You can also just write in the chat what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. another, yeah, go ahead. Don't worry. So, I'm going to move on. And essentially, we want two things that kind of contradict one another, right? On the one hand, we want something that's decentralized. So, we have isolation and scalability. And on the other hand, we kind of want to be able to query all Prometheuses at once. Um, it, so we need something that's kind of centralized. And if you're sitting here and you're going, oh, no, I don't need that. Like, I don't need to query all Prometheuses at once. Well, then for you, this talk is over, right? Like, just go with the simple one where you put a Prometheus inside each thing, and that's perfect. And if you're running everything in one Kubernetes cluster, and inside that Kubernetes cluster, it's easy to do the scraping, and you don't care at all about isolation or scalability, then this talk is over for you, too. Like just take one big Prometheus and scrape every, everyone with it. So we're going to continue, though, to speak about people who want both of these. If you want both the decentralized benefits and the centralized benefits, then we're going to need a solution that can handle that, because none of the solutions we saw so far do that. We have to compromise, and we have to choose between decentralized or centralized. So the elephant in the room here, and I can't talk about Prometheus, and I can't talk about any of this without touching on these, is scalability and long-term storage of metrics. This isn't really the topic of the talk because really we're speaking about multi-tenancy and the security concerns and isolation concerns. But if you're running Prometheus at scale, you are going to ultimately run into scalability issues and you are going to one probably do long-term storage of metrics. So for all of these, some of the solutions you look at will be the same solutions that we're looking at anyway for multi-tenant reasons. So I'm going to touch a little bit on that. Um, but it's not the main driving topic of this talk. And there's three basic approaches now beyond the two simple approaches, right? So before we had the approach where you had separate Prometheuses and we had centralized. And now we're going to look at three different approaches that build upon that and give us like a hybrid model. So the first one is we can solve this outside of Prometheus. Like we'll have multiple Prometheuses and we'll just fix it outside of Prometheus somehow. And we'll see what that looks like. The second approach is we're going to have multiple and we're going to have central. So we're going to have all these different Prometheuses, one in each tenant. And then we're going to have some centralized Prometheus thing that will know how to handle that. And then the third approach is we're going to take a centralized approach, but it's not going to really be plain vanilla Prometheus. We're going to put something else here that's big and centralized that kind of knows how to hand it and rhymes with uh, Premier uh, or something else like that. So we're going to look at the options over there. So those are the three broad approaches, and let's dive into the first one. So let's look at how we can solve it 
outside of Prometheus. So if we solve it outside of Prometheus, then the simplest version of this is if you have Grafana and you're setting up a multi-data source Grafana. So you have one Grafana running outside the cluster. And into this Grafana, you just added one data source for each one of your tenants. And now when you go into Grafana, then it can pull in data from each one of those individual Prometheus instances. That's also the approach that we personally take with Robusta, where we just query the data in whichever Prometheus it lives. So you get a unified view of it, but you're not really creating a unified Prometheus. Um, and the difference here is somewhat subtle. Um, it, so I can do, we, and when you're doing a solution like this, there are various hacks to try and do a little bit of aggregation client side, but really it's harder to write a big complex query that goes and it aggregates data from all the different instances because you don't have anyone who really understands PromQL who has a unified view of all the data. You can run PromQL queries on all these different faces, and 90% of the time, maybe that's what you want. But it doesn't give you the extra 10% where you really want to be able to write a PromQL query that gathers and aggregates data across all the different tenants. Um, and then there are other variations on this as well. Like if you think about it, sending all your data to PagerDuty is like somewhat of an alternative way of like getting all your alerts in one place. And then if you send uh, stack notifications from Alert Manager, um, then you're getting like all the data going to a single um, channel in stack or to a single stack workspace with multiple uh, channels. So you're like solving this in different ways outside Prometheus itself, but Prometheus itself is still really running all these different instances. Um, it, and I see here in the chat that there's a question here also about the storage aspects of metrics. Um, please do indeed feel free to connect um, on LinkedIn as you suggested. And the question is on production in the cloud, um, if it makes sense to push out to an external storage a solution with some sort of deletion policy. Um, and I, it's not in the scope of this exact talk, um, but please feel free to reach out afterwards as well. Um, so the first high, like the first more complex solution we looked at was solving outside of Prometheus. And like we said, then the advantages here are you're not really touching Prometheus itself. You're pushing the problem off to another tool. And the big disadvantage is you can really only write queries that address one Prometheus at a time. And again, there are hacks and some of the endpoints are smart. So they know how to aggregate the data a little bit client side, but we're not really gaining a single unified view of all the metrics. And maybe that matters, maybe that doesn't matter for you. What this method has going for it primarily is just that it's simple and it's easy to add on to existing environments. So now we need to move on to the second method. What we're going to do now with the second method is we're going to both do multiple and centralized. And the first variant on that is what's called federated Prometheus. So the way federated Prometheus works is we have one Prometheus inside each tenant. So we have here Prometheus and Alert Manager and all the associated tooling, and we're running that inside each and every one of the tenants. And then we have one big Prometheus that's sitting elsewhere, and that Prometheus, it goes and it does a federation, and it goes and it scrapes each of these. And if you read through the documentation, there are actually weird variants on this that I won't go into, but this is the core concept of federation. And in some ways, this gives you the worst of both worlds because you have to run a Prometheus inside each edge thing, and you have to run a big centralized Prometheus that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you do this, then this big Prometheus will eventually start to have scaling issues because you're pulling in all the data. So what you typically do with this is you use two different tricks. One is you selectively scrape. So this big federated Prometheus it doesn't pull in all the data from over here and all the data in from over here. It pulls in a certain subset that you care about for long-term storage or for the federated view. And then the second trick that you do is you roll up the data. So you reduce the resolution. So let's say in this Prometheus over here, you have resolution on a 10 second um, scale. And then when you pull in, you scrape it. And here you're only scraping it every five minutes. But what that means is we end up with something that sometimes is the worst of both because we have to maintain this big Prometheus, we have to maintain the small ones. And then when you try and get that centralized view and you query it, then you can't actually query the full resolution data um, because it's not there in the federated Prometheus. And then you have to deal with scaling issues anyway. Um, it, so this method seems, and this is very anecdotal, but it seems to be falling out of view, um, falling out of favor, um, and losing ground to the second method for multiple and central, which is, of course, Thanos. And I'm going to give a big disclaimer about Thanos, that Thanos has a ton of options, and it does more stuff than I'm speaking about. 
Um, Thanos is built as a project where you can use different parts and not use other parts. So you can mix and match and people use it for all sorts of different things. But what can I do? Um, we haven't made a time. I'm going to simplify. And hopefully I'll cover the important parts. So the simplest way that you can use Thanos is you set up one Thanos, and this is just the proxy. So in comes a Prometheus query, and Thanos is really, really smart. It understands Prometheus, and it knows how to break up that query and send that query to the relevant tenants. So the data is still here in each of these tenants. But when the query comes in, then Thanos is smart, and it knows how to handle it. And Thanos even has support for doing like deduping. So maybe over here, this Prometheus is actually highly available. So it goes and it queries two Prometheuses down there, but then it's smart enough to only take the results from one of them and to dedupe it. Thanos has a ton and ton of features, and it also has support for all sorts of other methods where like these Prometheuses write to long-term storage and they put in S3 buckets, and then Thanos queries the S3 buckets. Thanos, big, huge topic that deserves its own lecture. And I'm not going to do it justice here, but the thing to remember is that you can use Thanos where you're getting a single centralized view and you're querying the data that often lives elsewhere. And the advantages here is that it's super scalable because you can scale out each of these Prometheuses and Thanos itself was built to scale out even beyond that and then to put data in S3 buckets and to have all sorts of other options. You can reuse your existing Prometheuses um, and it's a super common solution, the number one common solution according to the poll I showed earlier. So by using Thanos, you're going to be on uh, the golden path that a lot of people um, already use, and that's very common. If you run into issues, other people already have had those issues. So it's very nice. Um, it, when I ever ask about Thanos, everyone always says Thanos is the most mature option here. Uh, so that's the majority opinion. And then there's one, um, and then there's one issue here that Thanos itself doesn't quite address, which is that there's no RBAC built in. So what I mean by that is let's say tenant one comes and it wants to query the data and you should only be able to see data from tenant one. Well, no problem, right? Just query this Prometheus inside the cluster. Don't go via the Thanos. And then along comes tenant two and tenant two wants to query only their data. Yeah, no problem. Just query the Prometheus inside this tenant. And now let's say someone comes and we have different teams and they only have access to the main Thanos and you want to say from the main Thanos, some people should be able to query tenants one, two, and three. And some people should only be able to query uh, tenants four, five, and six. Um, and you want to do different stuff and change who can query it from over here, from Thanos itself, that starts to get a little bit more complicated. It is doable. There's a solution we'll look at at the end of this talk, um, but it doesn't come out of the box. Thanos itself is kind of multi-tenant friendly, but it wasn't built from day one for multi-tenancy. And I see there's a question um, in the chat. I was thinking of taking this one step further than Prometheus, using the data in Grafana to visualize the data. Uh, like identifying services across data sources uh, to have two tenants with different resulting IDs. Um, can you maintain the identification uh, for a service across multiple uh, data sources slash tenants? So yeah, there are some cool things you can do here. Um, for example, with Prometheus, there's what's called, uh, I think, external labels. Um, there are some solutions, and if you tag everything right, then you can take advantage of some stuff we're going to touch on later on, and um, you can kind of have identities of tenants um, or identities of applications living across multiple tenants um, it, that's, that takes that into account. So like we see, we actually do see a lot of that uh, with Robusta. Um, but I think that's, I don't want to go too far off topic here. So um, please feel free to message me about that afterwards. Okay, so let's move on now to the third and final major approach. And this approach is we're going to have one big Prometheus. So we're going to go back to what we started with, right? Where we had one Prometheus, but now we're going to do it right this time. We're going to like, it's not just going to be Prometheus because we can't scale that. It's going to be something better than Prometheus that behaves very much like Prometheus. So the names here are probably familiar to most people. Um, there's Cortex, which was the original project that kind of did this. And then Grafana came along. And after years of uh, contributing to Cortex, um, they forked it and turned it into Mimir. And Mimir is really... If you're going to go with either Cortex or Mimir, I would recommend looking at Mimir. Grafana has done excellent work there, doing some cool stuff that we'll speak about on the next slide. And um, these are kind of the more Prometheus-like options. And then Victoria Metrics was, I believe, written from scratch to specifically build an alternative to Prometheus that's Prometheus-compatible um, and that's scalable. And 
I don't have much experience there myself, but I've heard excellent things from our customers that use Prometheus metrics. Um, so people seem very happy with it anecdotally. And then there's Timescale DB and M3DB, which came out of Uber. And both these I have a little bit less experience with. So I'm not going to be speaking about those at all, but they are options that are out there. And I probably missed some other people's uh, favorite options there as well. So I, I'm sorry for that. Um, and just try to take the top popular ones. And now let's do a deep dive on Mimir. And um, just as a reminder, Mimir and Cortex, um, I'm treating very similar. Think of I think of Mimir as an improved version of Cortex. Um, that's not exactly precisely correct, and this goes into open source politics. Um, but my pers personally, if I was looking at either Cortex or Mimir, I would look at Mimir. So the big advantage of Mimir, from my perspective, is that it has native support for multi-tenancy, which is really cool. And it's backed by Grafana, which is a great company. So by native multi-tenancy support, what I mean is when you ingest data into Mimir, you tag it and you say, this data, this time series, it belongs to tenant XYZ. And all the data going in has a very specific tenant ID. And when you query, you also say which tenant you are. And then you specify whether queries are even allowed to cross multiple tenants or not. And because this is built in and it's such like a core part of Mimir itself, then Mimir has really cool features around that. So you can say, for example, that tenants are only a, have a certain rate limit and they're only allowed to do a certain number of requests per second. Or tenants are only allowed to ingest, let's say, 10,000 samples per second. Um, but they're allowed to burst up to 20,000 samples for every amount of time. And Mimir was really built around these use cases. I believe some of the like uh, all these are in the mirror itself. And then there's some extra tooling around that, I believe in Grafana Enterprise. Um, and the number one complaint that I've heard about uh, Mimir is that it tends to be very complex. Um, and earlier in the chat, someone also wrote that they've had, um, I believe some performance or scalability issues. Um, and that it was a very resource intensive. Um, it, so I would say if you were looking at the options though, going back here one slide, um, and you're looking at options here, then you and you decide, I want to have one single centralized Prometheus, and I want to use that, and I want to um, just scale up this big instance, and I want to manage it in one place, then the top options to look at from what, um, from what I've seen people using would be these options here, um, where Mimir and Victoria Metrics are probably the most popular two options I see out of this list. Um, and again, I'm not affiliated, affiliated with any of these, um, so this is just kind of me speaking of what I've seen the most of. Uh, Dario, I don't know if you have anything to add here also uh, from the classic side and what you guys have seen the most. Well, it really depends, you know, it really depends. I don't want to rise, you know, the seniority bar here, but it really depends. Uh, I had really nice feedback also regarding the metrics, but also regarding timescale B, because in the end, I see that a lot of people are using timescale B both for the application side, but also for the metrics. It really depends, honestly, also on the seniority of the team and also the usage of the database. Oh, yeah. So that's a good point. That, that's an excellent point, actually. Timescale DB does something, has something going for it, which is that it can also handle traces. And um, uh, is it, do they also do logs or is it just uh, traces and metrics? I forget now. Uh, it should be, it's just a time series. So uh, you have to build on your own, I guess. Uh, Right. I had yeah. time to investigate that, honestly. You know that there are some hyper tables, something like that. Uh, it's the name of this feature, and you can translate a database, well, a database table as a time series table. Oh, yeah. Time scale is just Postgres under the hood, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, time scale is a very cool option for that reason. And I definitely heard the same thing about Victoria metrics. I know people who swear by it. Um, so I, I guess I'm, we're getting too much into, into opinion here and uh, into conjecture. And uh, somewhere in the chat that Adidas uses Victoria metrics. Um, interesting, I didn't know that. Um, you probably can't go wrong with any of the options on here. Um, M3DB is from Uber, so that's also definitely been used at scale. I think Chronosphere backs that. Um, and Cortex, of course, everyone was using before Mimir, so it's also a viable option. By before Mimir, I mean, everyone who's now using Mimir was using Cortex beforehand. People weren't using Thanos. If I just go back to what we said earlier at the beginning, then really the number one result that we see at the end of the day is Thanos. Um, Thanos, I definitely see the most of, and um, Thanos is the solution that uh, in the LinkedIn poll that we did that's the most common. 
Okay, so I want to speak about one more thing, um, it, which is a very useful tool when you're doing multi-tenancy called uh, prom label proxy. And there are two forks of this, one I believe in OpenShift and one in Prometheus community. And what these let you do is they let you do our back on the query. So you can specify certain tenants, certain people are allowed to query, let's say Thanos or any of the other Prometheus endpoints, but they're only allowed to write queries where they're querying for like a specific uh, Kubernetes application. Or they're only allowed to do queries where they're querying the data that came from a specific cluster. So by using prom label proxy, you can um, do that R back and you can add that onto Thanos and to other solutions. Uh, so it's a very cool solution out there. Um, and it's one that lets you use Thanos and then handle those security concerns as well. If you want to give certain tenants um, access to query like uh, certain other data and really set up R back there for who can query what. And um, I just want to say a special thank you. Um, we're getting to the end of this, but I want to give a special thank you also to people who gave me inputs um, on this and um, about what they're doing within their company about edge cases that they've hit, which I also used in putting this together. Um, so thank you to everyone who uh, chimed in on that. And um, in general, also, a lot of the talks that I do um, they have data and input from people who are telling me in the community what they're doing and what issues they've had, they've ran into. So I always love to hear from people about what they're doing. And I think that covers everything. So uh, with that, we'll go into questions. Yeah, we got some questions. So thank you so much, Nathan. Really, really interesting. Also, because I've been there, you know, I've been a side bit engineer and I remember the pain also to manage all the metrics and also all the problems that we had at that company with metrics. So we got some questions. So just give me some seconds uh, to find those. Uh, well, this is not a question, but rather a uh, um, perspective, um, point of view. So personally, uh, by Stefano, is uh, from Italy, I guess. Uh, personally, I'm using one big prom Prometheus or Mimir plus Loki for logs and scraping every Kubernetes or even single server by using Grafana agents. I think that it's pretty common, I'd say, this stuff. Yeah, it's true. You're pushing off... so. There's, an, there's another sports solution, which I should have gave, right? It, co it goes into the one big Prometheus solution. Like if I go back to, um, if I go back over here to like the centralized, then there's another variant on this, which is um, called centralized, but someone else's problem. Um, it, so that like, if you're using Grafana Cloud, if you're using like log ZIO, then um, you also can say like, okay, I'm going to have one big centralized one, but someone else will run it. Um, it and it's a very good answer too. Also, um, Stefano, um, it, like you also can do that with one big Mimir or Prometheus. It doesn't have to be hosted by someone else. Um, I don't see as many people scraping with Grafana agents, um, but I know I know definitely it's a thing that people do. Well, we got also another question by Miguel Sanchez. So what's the best solution for observability? Logs, uh, plus traces, plus metrics. Grafana tools, question. Um, it seems to be the most popular solution, right? So Do I know Docky is very popular for dogs and or Loki. Uh, I guess it's Loki. I know Loki is very popular for dogs. Um, and again, this is all anecdotal, but people I know using Loki are happier with Loki than the people I know using Elasticsearch are happy with Elasticsearch. Um, very anecdotal, um, but it's what I've seen. And then for traces, um, it, I don't see as many people actually, I see a lot of people talking about traces. I don't see as many people doing that much tracing in practice, but the, definitely Jaeger is a good option. And um, I think Grafana now has Tempo, right? And some mm -hmm. stuff on itself. Um, I'll give a shout out to my own company. I mean, we do, we do Kubernetes observability. We're not doing any of the hard problems, right? Like we hand off the hard metrics and like the time series database and everything we spoke about here. We hand that off to like Prometheus or to, we, we hand up all the hard parts there and then we just do like a single pane of glass or Kubernetes that pulls in the data from elsewhere. Um, so obviously that's what I'm using, but <laughs> that's very biased. Yeah, just a brief um, reminder to all the people that is uh, watching this event right now. So if you have any question, please write that on the chat or don't be shy, open your microphone. We are really keen to have your feedback. And meanwhile, I got also a question for Nathan. Ah, 
Uh, Miguel Sanchez just replied, I mean, if I use Grafana, I have correlation with logs plus traces plus metrics. Oh, yeah. Yep. That makes sense. Yep. And we got also from DH, and which setup fits the best with the GitOps processes, uh, Grafana Mimir or Tenos? As far as I know, Grafana resources like dashboards are pretty complex to manage, modify outside from web UI. Oh, Grafana resources like dashboards are pretty complex to manage. Honestly, I remember that when I was a certain bit engineer, we were having our JSON files and those were applied automatically in some way. So I don't know what you're referring for, but There's, maybe- I have a confession. I have a confession to make here, okay? So before I get like, got in, really involved in monitoring observability. I was just a developer. I was developing on Kubernetes. And we had, um, we would deploy, the DevOps team would deploy in each cluster that we worked on um, at Grafana. And then I would go in and I would edit, at the, in the very early days, I would edit Grafana dashboards. And then eventually like the cluster would get torn down or no, I think the Grafana pod would restart. And I didn't understand why my changes were never saved. Um, it, Cause it, there wasn't, they hadn't set up persistent storage. Um, and it's true that we could have set it up with GitOps and there was a Git repo somewhere, but like as a, just a lowly developer, I didn't even know where I should go and write that even if I wanted to, once I understood the problem. Um, so I think in practice, it's easy to set up with GitOps and you could do it, but I think many people aren't, aren't doing it in practice because you end up with these like two flows, right? There's a flow where you put it in GitOps and edit it in like the platform team is managing that. And then there's a flow where you edit it in the UI, but then writing that back to GitOps um, is inconvenient, not for technical reasons, as much as like process reasons. Yeah. We will also, I can feel the pain of this question and it's by Stefano. So Grafana and Loki are now also on a Kubernetes cluster, but my problem is the space. <laughs> Welcome to the club. And I've been using Min.io, but as far as I know, Prometheus isn't able to write to S3 directly, but Thanos does. Is there any way to write metrics only to S3 API compatible? Question to you, Nathan. There might be. Um, I, I mean, okay, so I'll first mention Thanos again, even though uh, me. I, I think this question was trying to avoid Thanos, but um, th so Thanos can do that. And um, Thanos, that's you take though only some of the selected parts. So I believe you can use the Thanos parts that write to S3 storage without taking some of the other ones. Um, but if you really don't want to use Thanos, I know there's a page in the, Kubernetes, in the Prometheus docs about integrations and um, under the hood, Thanos and a lot of other solutions use what's called remote read and remote write. Um, so I believe what you'd be looking for is a remote write integration that writes to S3. And I don't remember off the top of my head if there's something native or not, but it probably is doable. So you can remote write from Prometheus, for example, into uh, Google BigQuery. So there are various options there. Um, feel free to message me afterwards and I'll like, look it up properly. Um, yeah, don't worry, Nathan, also because I saw a lot of interest from the people that is attending this event. And I also tried to create a sort of poll uh, to invite you again to talk about Thanos or maybe oh. <laughs> uh, Mimir would be really great also. So no, um, don't be shy, people. Uh, comment also on meetup.com asking for Nathan. So we are going to force him to join again for a second session. Anyway, jokes apart. Um, we got a question by Eric. Braki, uh, I'm sorry for butchering the surnames, but it happens to me every time. So isn't there also the method of using multiple Prometheus with a single database? I think GCP is using their Monarch database in this way. So there are multiple, yeah, there are. There are multiple approaches on this. So um, it, there, when I said that Thanos is complicated and I'm not doing it justice, then like, here's another example. So. The reason here that we spoke here about Thanos and how you have like a centralized Thanos and it queries different ones, but this is a, th there's actually a reason why the arrows here are bidirectional in the diagram, because there is a method where you can set it up, I think with the Thanos sidecars that they're also doing a remote write to some central thing. Um, it, I didn't prepare this, so I'm like off the hook on this. I need to really go look at the documentation, but there are options like that. And then even if you do centralized, then sometimes you do centralized with a bunch of small ones too. So like uh, if you have Grafana agent running in each of your clusters, Grafana agent is almost like a mini Prometheus that's scraping and then it's doing a remote write to the centralized one. So 
uh, yeah, you can really do that where you're having like multiple Prometheuses, but then they're writing it to a centralized one or even with Thanos where they have like two hour storage locally and then they're writing it to um, like uh, S3 for long for longer term. So there are a lot of variations on it. And I, think, I see Stefano wrote about the, oh, you wrote the follow-up about that, right? Yeah, I think this is also related to this question because since multiple Prometheus will not have all the metrics, how do you handle alerts? So they don't alert or missing alerts because of the absence of the alert metrics. Are you using, uh, suge uh, is suggesting Prometheus Federation, multiple alerts, file for each Prometheus, Thanos ruler? Oh, yeah. So, okay, so interesting. So yeah, uh -huh. if we go back, so if we go back a little bit, like when I run back over here, then if you want to do an alert where you're alerting, like look, taking a global view or looking at what's missing, right? And But you want to do it based on time series and stuff, then you do have to have that query that way to query all Prometheuses at once. Mm -hmm. So if you have one centralized um, Thanos, or if you have one centralized one over here, then you actually can like query on that type of thing. And then there's an answer there also about the heartbeat from um, Markin or Marsin. Um, it, and what I think is um, one way we see that, for example, is like, let's say you're sending alerts um, to page or duty, then um, Prometheus can send that like um, heartbeat. And I think, I think, Stuff like Pager Duty has dead man's, um, what do they call it? The dead man uh, trigger. Dead man switch. Dead man switch. So I, I think again, I'm off the cuff here. I didn't prepare this, but I vaguely recall there being something where you can set it up to like see when stuff isn't arriving from a destination, um, or like what we do in Robust is we're not looking at the existence. We get the dead man, but then the heartbeat, but then we ignore it. But we look to see if your cluster is communicating like via different agents. So like. There are other methods where you can try and approach it. Um, and then another way would be looking back at the questions from Saurav. Another way would be to keep the Grafana dashboard deployments as part of infrastructure as code. Not sure how common it is. Yeah, people do it. So I, I'd say there are two people who are doing this. There's people who are doing this accidentally. Um, like my first experience as a developer when I went to edit it and then I didn't realize why it got reverted all the time. Um, and then there are people who are doing it intentionally. Um, and they actually go and they like update the Grafana dashboards and infrastructure as code and stuff when they change the dashboards. Mm -hmm. So it's like a good way to do it. And there is a variation on this in terms of the storage. Um, there's a variation on this with the storage where you're um, doing it in infrastructure as code and it's like in Helm and in GitOps. And then there's a variation on this, I believe. There's a custom, there's like an operator for Grafana where you can store as a custom resource in your cluster. And then the storage is not GitOps, the storage is at CD, if that makes sense. So there are multiple variants on that. And yeah, it's a cool approach. Yeah, a lot of questions. I'm really happy to see so many engagements here. And I got a question for you, Nathan. So we were talking about multiple Prometheus instances in the same cluster. And the question is, what do you think about the Prometheus operator? Because I'm a big fan of operators. I'm writing operators all the day long. So what's your feedback about that? I'm a convert. I, I At first, I didn't get it, but now I totally get it. I'm, I'm hugely in favor. Like when we deploy with the robust type, you don't have Prometheus. We deploy the operator for you. Mm -hmm. um, so strongly, strongly in favor of the operator. I've come out. When I first got started like the Kubernetes, I didn't fully get it. But today, I completely understand. Um, so for people who aren't in the loop, then the operator is giving a few things. Um, one, it's making Prometheus native on Kubernetes. So I can run kubectl edit Prometheus rule, and I can like define all that. And then another thing that's really useful for multi-tenancy is if I want to create a new Prometheus, then I just have to create a new resource. So I can go like kubectl apply, and I just create a new like uh, kubectl get, uh, what is it, Prometheus or something like that, Prometheus is. And it makes it really easy to spin up on the fly another copy of Prometheus and another engine and whatever you want. Um, very, very easily. Um, so definitely a huge fan. I think the one place where it becomes tricky, and that's a little bit of a friction point, is it goes back to like GitOps and infrastructure as code. On the one hand, you want to have one source of truth and you want to have everything in GitOps. But on the other hand, like if an alert's firing in the middle of the night and I just want to go and like tweak the threshold or silence it, like I really don't want to go now and open up a PR and Git for that. So I think there is some interesting unsolved problems still around how to make the workflows like feel 
convenient enough that you actually do them instead of like you just ignoring the other or like letting the spam pile up or right? not tweaking the threshold. So I think there is some fundamental friction there. Like how do you make it easy for people to tweak the threshold on an alert in Prometheus while still having that single source of truth in GitOps and so on? So we think about that a lot. I don't know. I don't have, uh, maybe, maybe one day we'll do something interesting around that, but not yet. Yeah. I really love, by the way, the operator. I got just some remarks regarding the service monitor resource. I don't remember. Uh, it was designed by CoreOS because they were the first maintainer of the cube, uh, of the Prometheus operator. And every time, I don't know if the service monitor has been picked up by the Prometheus. So I'm saying, oh, is it working or not? So I have to do kubectl port forward to the Prometheus, checking the targets and saying, why it doesn't take the targets? Oh my gosh, yeah. It's a bit tricky uh, because they're missing the status. So it's really hard to say that. But anyway. Um, you can just see a checkbox, like this is now being scraped. It's all good. Yeah, right? it would be really good. Yeah, yeah. But we got other questions. So how can we ensure that the Prometheus metrics scrape from a multi-tenant Kubernetes environment are accurate and reliable and what measures uh, can be taken to prevent data skew and noisy neighbor issues? Oh, the last one regarding noisy neighbor. Yeah, it's really cool. So, okay, so you have to help me, focus me a little bit on this, on, on the parts that you want me to address. I could speak a lot about the noisy neighbor in general with resources, um, it, or I could speak a little bit about, um, it, like specifically the Prometheus, aspects if you have a single Prometheus that's like scraping multiple tenants in the same thing. Well, I think that Dorian, if you want, you can also open your microphone to try to elaborate a bit more. But I think that the point here is the fact that if you have a lot of targets to scrape in a multi-tenant environment, you can have issues uh, with the time where the metrics are picked up. So I think that's the data skew. And also yeah, regarding... exactly, Dario. Yeah. Thank you for yeah, explaining yeah. better. Yeah, yeah. And also regarding noisy neighbors, uh, it's a problem that we're seeing with Capsule. I am a maintainer of Capsule. And noisy neighbors is when you got uh, neighbors, so pods that are consuming a lot of CPUs and are making noise. So I think it's related also to Prometheus or the metrics scraped uh, by the operator or something like that. So yeah, it's a plus one. So that's the topic. I'm on, so I'm very unpopular at parties because I go around telling everyone to get rid of their CPU limits, <laughs> which I can help with the noisy neighbors. People think it's the opposite way around. Um, but I'll elaborate on that for a second, and I'll go on to the rest of the question. Um, when you have noisy neighbors in general, there are two ways that you can protect yourself against the noisy neighbor. So the first way, like, okay, imagine you're, you have a cup of water, right? And like you're fighting over who gets to drink it. So one way is to pour yourself like half the cup that you want to drink and then like leave the other half a cup aside. Like if they drink it, they drink it, whatever. It's like you have your part, so you don't care what they do. And then the other way to approach it is to say like, you're only allowed to drink so much and give them a straw where they can only suck you up via like a certain volume. And maybe you're drinking, maybe you're not drinking. Maybe like something gets poured out and wasted. So those two approaches in Kubernetes correspond to using requests and using limits. When you use a request, then you're saying this amount of resources is saved aside for me. No one else can touch it if I need it. Um, and that's almost, you'd call it a soft limit, but in Kubernetes, it's called a request. And then the other way is to do a hard limit where you're saying this other person, they can't consume more than X, no matter what I'm consuming. It doesn't matter. Like you're not allowed to consume more than X. And the problem where it gets tricky is that very often people have a problem of one type, but they misinterpret it and they think it's the problem of the opposite type. So for example, um, it, let's say you're using CPU limits and you gave your neighbor a CPU limit of two so that you can't use up more than two CPUs. And you gave yourself a CPU limit of two so that you can't use up more CPUs. And now you go, or um, let's make the numbers different. You gave your neighbor a CPU limit of two and you gave yourself a CPU limit of three. Um, and now you see CPU throughout the link. So people go and they go, oh, it's the neighbor. You have to change the CPU limit to, to one, make him use up less CPU. But very often that's not the case. Very often what's subtle here and kind of nasty is that it's actually your own CPU limit of two that's preventing you from getting the resources you need. And what makes it particularly nasty is that you can look at your average CPU usage and you could be at like, I don't know, half a CPU, but you could still be hitting your limit of two because it just means that like you're spiking up and now you're hitting the limit. 
and then you're going back down, you're doing nothing for a very long period of time. So on average, you're actually using very little. But when it spikes in the very, very short periods of time that spike, you're getting bit by the mimic. So to make a long story short, um, there definitely are noisy neighbor issues. And my advice on that is always make sure everyone has good requests, but remove the limits. Um, but there are other approaches, of course. And uh, sometimes I get booed out parties when I say that. So um, what can you do? Yeah, also regarding the data skew, um, I think it's related also to the internals of Go because I know for experience that when you're Go, Go is really a nice programming language. I'm using that all the day long and I really love that. But it got some disadvantages, well, especially when you're using Go uh, at scale because if you have multiple Go routines at the same time, obviously the uh, having a sort of trigger across all the Go routines you're ending up in a minor skew because there are issues with the scheduler of the Linux and it could be affected also by the uh, underlying infrastructure. So I'd say, but I'm not the Prometheus expert, so Nathan, please ask me if I say something wrong, but maybe what you could do is to create some set of quality of services regarding metrics. So if you need a perfect uh, time trigger, you could have a quality of service for the gold, for the silver, for the bronze, for the shard, or maybe, I don't know if it could be helpful or not, although I'd say it's a sort of anti-pattern, you could say, okay, these metrics are really important for me, and I'm not going to get scraped, but rather I could have a sort of sidecar that is pushing the metrics. But although I'm not so sure about that, because uh, when you're dealing with HTTP, also the web server of Prometheus is running with Go routines, so maybe you could have also the time skews. Um, it's really tricky. I don't want to say it really depends, but that's the yeah. answer. Uh, it really depends. So I would I say it depends on whether you're, the issue is the application or if the issue is the Prometheus. Yeah. If the issue is that the application is like CPU throttle and it's not getting enough resources to actually respond to even when you're coming to scrape it, the metrics, um, then you have to like tweak stuff in the application or the request and limits. And then if the skew though is because you have a big, like you have a small Prometheus that's scraping a lot of big things, then I would just view it as a general Prometheus scaling problem um, and like tackled it regardless of the multi-tenancy. So that would mean either moving to like a better centralized solution, like Victoria metrics, for example, um, I don't know how Mimir does with Grafana agents in that case, uh, but the Victoria metrics is like a good example of scaling it up um, or moving to like the decentralized solution where now you have a bunch of different Prometheuses that are doing the actual scraping, but then maybe they're like writing with uh, Thanos to something else or they're writing to like long-term S3 storage or I don't know. So I would kind of view as the scaling issue. And again, take why I say here though with a grain of salt, like regarding Victoria metrics and regarding other solutions, um, it's not why I prepared this talk on. I don't have as much like experience hitting my head against the wall with all of them. So I'm mostly just speaking about what I've seen from other people that they're doing. Yeah. So Nathan, uh, we're approaching the end of our meeting and we got several messages saying thank you so much, Nathan, and also Dario for these wonderful insights. I would like to thank you all the people here. And I'd say that you can do several things. The first one is joining our meetup. The second one is to connect on LinkedIn with Nathan. And keep in mind that KeepCon Europe is approaching. Nathan will be there uh, with the Robusta Dev booth. I don't remember the name uh, of your booth. Should be SU? Do you, I think do you remember? I, it's SU single digit. Either like single seven digit. or nine or something. Single digit. Maybe but SU six. Not gonna... Yeah, because I remember that I, I saw that it should be SU6, but it doesn't matter. Uh, reach out to Nathan on LinkedIn or on Robasta uh, LinkedIn page to get more details. Uh, stop by their booth to know more about Robasta Dev and all the background. Stop by the Dev. classics, but the classics. Yeah, also, also, also. Uh, multi-tenancy and stuff. Yeah, it should be SU23, if I recall correctly. Uh, please, Marcello, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm doing too much. Uh, yeah, I'm go I got to too many Go routines running at the same time. So I got some skews regarding information. But yeah, stop to our booth. Uh, yeah. We are in the start, uh, startup section. You can find us uh, on the top of the... Um, it should be 20, 23. 23. 23, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. So uh, join us on meetup.com, on LinkedIn, follow Nathan and Robusta Dev. 
And please provide us a feedback if you would like to get more insights regarding metrics, uh, observability, so we can take Nathan in Ostage and asking for more oh, webinars yes. like this would be really cool. You know how I know oh. it was a really good webinar? <laughs> when people come to me afterwards and they tell me I got stuff wrong, <laughs> which maybe means it was a bad webinar, but I have it on a more serious note, um, please reach out also. I'd love to hear from people and their experience. Um, and it is the first time I'm giving this specific talk as well. So if I did get stuff wrong, like don't don't be shy. It's okay. Um, and um, thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, it has been a pleasure. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. See you all, guys. Thanks, Nathan. Bye-bye.